Welcome to Opalize TV. Today I'm in Sydney together with Jack Lovenstein. He's the Joint Chief Investment Officer and Managing Director of Morsic Asset Management here in Sydney. Jack, please give us your background and tell us more about your company. I've been in the investment management industry for about 15 years now. Before that, I had, had brief careers in stockbroking and corporate finance, and then quite a long career as a journalist, mostly as a business journalist. So I've come from a fairly unusual background, I guess, compared to most, most managers. I set up Morphic, manage, Morphic Asset Management about three years ago with a former colleague of mine from my previous employer, Hunter Hall Investment Management. My colleague Chad and I had a very good track record at Hunter Hall, and we decided we wanted to go out and do something a little bit different. Hunter Hall was a global equities manager, but long only, although it had a fairly free mandate to invest in non-equity classes like gold or uh, bonds and, and so on. What we wanted to do when we set up Morphic Asset Management was set up a, a long bias, long short fund with a macro overlay, which we thought would be the best way of managing money through the cycle and give us the flexibility to manage the net exposure in a, a wider range than we would have done if we were just a long only manager and also take advantage of opportunities we saw to do uh, shorting to achieve long short, uh, long short pairs or to help us manage our sector and country exposures. So Jack, please tell us more about the strategy in detail, what's your universe and also more about your track record you've been achieving. We actually launched the fund on August the 2nd, 2012 which for the benefit of hindsight was as close to perfect timing as you could hope for in an absolute return sense because uh, that was when markets had more or less bottomed and they had a pretty sustained rally not you know, ever since. So we we're up about uh, um, you know, very substantially since we launched in absolute terms and I guess that um, we're a slightly unusual beast in the sense that we feel that we're a bit of a hybrid in that our, we, our investors not only expect us to achieve positive absolute returns but they also expect us to beat our benchmark, which is the MSCI All Countries Total Return Index. Um, in a very strong bull market, it's obviously very hard to manage risk and beat the index, but we're more or less there, so that's quite a satisfactory outcome from our point of view. Our track record at Hunter Hall was, was a pretty good one, so I speak, I speak for Chad and myself. We actually had a particularly good GFC in that we managed to achieve positive returns during the GFC, taken as a whole period when the market was actually down. That was very satisfactory. But when we set up the new business, we were very keen to not just replicate what we've done at Hunter Hall, but also to do it with a, a, a broader team. So in, in, the, um, in, in the spirit of what we were trying to do, the first person we hired was our risk manager. We made an excellent hire in the form of a chap called Jeff Wood, who'd previously worked um, on both sides of the street, meaning he'd worked as a, in prime broking and as a risk manager for a global macro fund. So Jeff joined us first. We also hired a very experienced stock picker as our head of research, a guy called Tim Chung, who'd worked at Commonwealth Bank, various arms of the Commonwealth Bank in Australia, and then went off to Wharton to do his MBA, and finally came back. And after a brief period running his own specialist long short fund, joined us. Uh, his uh, strategy was a bit narrow. He was only investing in gaming and gambling stocks. So he had a great track record, but it was very hard to raise money. So he folded his tent and joined us. And since then, we've hired three more investment professionals. So we now have a seven-man team, which is quite a large team for a, a boutique startup. And in building the business, we've been very fortunate in that Westpac Bank, for its Ascalon uh, fund incubation business, has decided to take a 35% uh, stake in our business and to help us grow our our funds under management. So by the end of this year, we'll be close to $100 million in terms of FUM, which we regard as a, as, as, as a very good outcome for a business that's less than three years old. So the investment universe for us is primarily equities. We can invest on the long side in any, in any company with a market capitalization of more than $400 million US dollars. On the short side, we have a $1 billion cutoff. We can also invest, and we do invest, in, in rates, in bonds, both on the long and short side in commodities, and, and obviously we also do a lot of currency hedging. Jack, tell us more about your investor base. Who is invested with you and who is looking at you at the moment? Basically, we have three, three groups in our, in our investor base. 
The first is high net worth individuals who know me or Chad or other members of the team who've given us money based on our track record and their personal relationship. The second, which is by far the biggest, is investors through financial planners and so on in Australia. Again, many of whom these, many of these financial planners have known me for a long time. And when we set up the business rather bravely, and we're very grateful for it, decided that they would immediately give us some money they'd previously allocated elsewhere. And the third base obviously now is the uh, Ascalon Westpac group, who have given us $30 million as seed funding for a three-year period to help us get to a critical mass where more people can look at us. In Australia, until you're about $100 million, there are large numbers of people who just can't look at you. And as we reach that point, we expect our investor base to grow quite rapidly and there to be more people from the high net worth uh, set who come in through private bankers, as well as more financial planning groups who are allowed to alloc allocate funds to us. So Escalon as a company that provides seeding and acceleration capital, obviously they have lots of choices. Jack, why do you think Escalon choose your firm, Morphic Asset Management? We spent about a year talking to Ascalon before they decided to make the investment. And I think what attracted them to us was, first of all, there aren't that many uh, managers in Australia who are doing global equities on any, in any, any serious scale. So that was the first point I think that attracted them to us, us to them, sorry. Uh, the second attraction was that we are employing a long short strategy, which is a level of sophistication that perhaps most uh, managers in Australia are not doing. There are quite a few long only managers but there are relatively few long-short managers. And I think the other thing they liked about us was we were already able to demonstrate that we were achieving very good returns with quite low volatility, um, at, while, while capturing most of the market upside, and indeed, you know, pretty well all of the market upside. So the key for us was to get good upside capture to try and minimise the drawdowns. Obviously, we, don't, we cannot guarantee there won't be any drawdowns at all. As a long buyers fund, we really have to school our investors to expect periods when we will actually deliver negative returns. But the aim is to try and cap those down, those down periods and then make it up in, uh, in, in that period to get yourself ahead of the index over a one and two year period. Australia is a somewhat unusual market. We have a, a fairly young investor base in Australia compared to most developed countries. And as a result, I think people in Australia really, when they go to a, even a long short manager, they do want to make sure they get upside capture. And they, they want to know that you're going to be out there trying to protect them in big sell-offs, especially given the history we have had in the last, you know, last decade. But, they, but their primary concern is to make sure they get full market capture for the upside. Jack, give us more details. What is distinctive about your style of investing? Well, I guess our style really starts with our name. We call ourselves Morphic Asset Management, which is a made up word, because more, the idea was to connote the fact that we're flexible and that we will morph, we will change. As a result, we are very determinedly not style, bi style biased. Uh, we try to recognize that there are going to be periods in, in any market cycle when value or growth or momentum will be the major driver of returns. And the way we, we operate is to try and look for, firstly, for stocks that have got that are trading on low prices that are of good quality and have got positive earnings revision and share price momentum. But also to recognize that there are reasons why some of these styles work particularly well in the conjunction. And we're very struck, as have, many people, as have been many people, that value and momentum, which are two very odd bedfellows, actually work very well together. And we've thought a lot about this. And I guess our view is that value uh, has a, if you look at value as a style, its biggest problem is it can leave you uh, in, in, in value traps. So the, the way we try to avoid that is to employ momentum as our test to avoid the, the, the value traps. Because we, don't, we don't want to invest in falling in stocks that are sort of uh, perpetually falling. We don't want to be in the, um, the last buggy whip manufacturer, if you like, um, which is the, the famous test of a, of a the floor in value investing. At the same time, momentum investors do very well until momentum rolls over. So we like to, put, to talk about the following kind of image. We talk about Mr. Mr. Value and Mr. Momentum going out to parties together. And Mr. Mr. Value's problem is he always wants to go home too early. And Mr. Momentum's job is to say, come on, the fun is just starting, to, starting here. Stick around, don't be too miserable, enjoy the ride. But Mr. Value's job 
is to say at a certain point in the party, uh, this is all getting a bit too wild. Uh, there's absolutely no value left now. Let's get out of the party before the police arrive. So that's the, basically the, uh, the, if you like, the image we, that we employ to try and uh, make sure that we don't get, don't sell our winners too early. At the same time, don't get left stranded when uh, things have gotten really crazy. So, so the way we do that is we do a lot of, we, we have basically two sources of, of um, ideas for our portfolios. First of all, we employ typical quant-based screening te techniques to try and identify a sub-universe of stocks that we can invest in that have these characteristics of being relatively cheap, high quality, with growth, and positive earnings revision momentum and share price momentum. And that's very useful, I think, particularly at market turning points. And then on the other hand, we also have our macro top-down ideas. So let's give you some examples. Uh, when we launched the fund in the first place, uh, we were very, very struck by the fact that the US house builder stocks we're trading as though there would never be any recovery in, in the state of US housing. Now, to us, that was absurd. Yet the long run average for new starts in the US housing market is about 1.5 million in a year. Uh, and the market was pricing housing stocks as though it would never get much above three or 400,000, which is where it was at that time. What was very interesting about this is we, we used that top-down methodology to work out what housing what housing stock, house builder stocks should trade on at the point in the cycle we were at and found that it was 30 or 40% higher than it actually was. Very quickly, the market actually followed us in that, in that trade and priced them as though they were already fully recovered and that was our point for exit. However, we used momentum in that process to say, well, let's enjoy the ride a bit, but then it got to the point where we could see that the, the, the market was already pricing a full recovery in the US home builders, so we exited. Um, on the screen-based side, uh, we have a similar approach. So an example of one of our more successful investments, we invested in a, um, a Irish-listed European cardboard box manufacturer called Smurfit Kappa. It was crazily cheap. We could see lots of reasons why it might actually do very well. It was a, um, a private equity relisting, which has been relisted with too much debt at very expensive terms. As the credit markets improved, they were able to pay down their debt quickly and reprice the debt at much better, on much better terms. And of course, the, um, the cardboard box market in Europe and Latin America where they operated showed some signs of recovery. So the stock did very well. And then for reasons we couldn't quite grasp at first, it kept on doing better and better. And of course, that's where luck came into it. Smurfit Cap is one of the largest companies listed in Ireland. Uh, the Irish stock market was having a major recovery of its own. And so we used that final phase, that blow off phase, if you like, when the Irish market alone was driving the price of Smurfit Kappa to stage our exit. Obviously, risk management plays a strong role in your style of investing. Tell us more details about your procedures there. Well, risk management is not just part of our process, it's actually part of our culture. And that's why we, the first person that Chad and I hired was our risk manager, Jeff Wood. So we could build the culture around him, if you like. And uh, Jeff's role is to obviously manage all the macro risks that we see. So we run scenario testing for our portfolio based on likely events, we, we, you know, not likely negative events we see over the, land, over the horizon. But also at the stock and position level, we run very tight stop losses. And um, I know for many people, stop losses are scratch your head, what am I going to do now moments. For us, stop, loss, stop losses are surgery carried out without anesthesia. If a stock that we have in our portfolio or any position in our portfolio hits its stop loss, it is exited completely without any reference to the, um, the relevant funds manager or, or CIO. It's just cut and we have a one month review process before it can even be re-entered. So for us, stop losses are a very important part of the process. We also think they give us a lot of, a lot of freedom because obviously with, the, with relatively tight stop losses, we feel quite free to take risk. And taking risk is obviously the key issue in any risk management culture. It's all very well to avoid um, having losers, but the key thing is to try and find some winners as well. So we find the two work together very, very effectively. So the, the aim of this entire process is obviously to try and reduce the volatility because we do know that as we get bigger, we'll attract more and more institutional interest. And clearly that kind of, of market is very focused on the volatility adjusted returns we achieve which today have been pretty good. Jake, you already started to introduce us to your team. Tell us more about them.
Well, I think that team culture is actually one of the major determinants of success in the funds management industry. I've been working with, uh, with a variety of people over many years, and I have to say that I'm now more happy than I've ever been with the mix of, of people that we have in our team. A wide range of, of educational backgrounds. We also have a very wide range of what I call life experiences. Uh, I'll give you some examples. I think the, the common thread between all of our team is that we've all been foreigners most of our life. I'm an Australian who was, who was born here and grew up in England with, a, with an American father. Chad, my, my founding partner, is actually a New Zealander, though he keeps it pretty quiet. He was educated in Australia, but spent most of his life growing up in Papua New Guinea, which is a small country or a large country with not many people living to the north of Australia. Um, Jeff Wood is an Englishman who migrated here some years ago. Uh, Tim Chung, our head of research, is a Hong Kong Chinese, but he actually sounds more Australian than the rest of us, has lived here most of his life. And as I say, he's been educated in the US. Uh, Mike Walpole is probably the most mixed up person in our entire team. He was actually born in Poland, grew up in Egypt, educated in England, and is married to a Thai Chinese and decided to come back to Australia some years ago. So we really have a very mixed team, which I think is very important when you're running a global mandate to have that huge range of experience across many countries, uh, obviously many cycles, and, and many different outlooks on life. So there's always someone who surprised me every morning at our morning meeting with some piece of knowledge I never thought anybody in the team would have. When we set the business up, we were determined that we would have at least public company level governance for the entire business. So we have an independent chairman, who's a chap called Nick Minogue, who was the former head of risk at Macquarie Bank. He uh, was a very successful person at Macquarie, one of the four or five men team that guided the bank through the GFC so effectively. And uh, so we're very grateful to have him as our chairman. We also have a chap called Gerard Benack, who runs a independent research house on, on markets and, eco and economics, formerly a managing director level member of, of Morgan Stanley based in Sydney. And we have two representatives of Westpac, being Rob Lance, who runs the Asplon business in Sydney, and Harvey Carter, who is the head of M&A at Westpac. And lastly, we have a gentleman called George Gabriel, who represents all the minority investors in our business. So we have a seven-man board, of whom only two, Chad and myself, are executives. So we really feel that we have, as I say, a public company level of governance for the business. So the last part of our, of our governance process is that Jeff Wood, our risk manager, has a direct line to our chairman to report any issues he feels he may arise in terms of our approach to, uh, to, to risk governance and our risk guidelines. That's the kind of rule we hope will never be required but it's very helpful to know it's there. Jack, what's the outlook that you have on your fund and your strategy? Well, we're speaking now towards the end of October, and in that context, I think that we are now uh, pretty confident that the market will probably continue to grind up from here, the stock market. We said at the, at the um, middle of the year that we thought there was quite a good prospect that the uh, S&P 500 would see 2000, not as a barrier, but as a kind of launch pad to a, another five or 10% rally. So we're still expecting a, a fairly constructive outlook for equity markets globally. That's notwithstanding our expectation that next year we'll see rate rise in the US, probably two or three, um, and that monetary policy will start to tighten a very little bit in the US, but not enough to derail the equity market. Uh, so we're quite bullish about the US. We are currently fairly long US financials and we believe that there's a, a real premium going to be paid for growth financials. So there's a tremendous range of banks, for example, in the US, some of which are hardly growing at all, other which, others of which are growing very well with what we see as very good risk control. And we're definitely long, higher quality regional banks in the US where we see a very good risk-adjusted return prospect. In Europe, we're much more cautious. We do feel that Europe has yet to really understand that the euro is at the heart of its problems and that it is impossible to run Europe as though it's just a series of, of um, tributary states to Germany. It's not good for Germany and it's not good for Europe. So we think that there's a high prospect of another 
round of uncertainty about the place of the euro. And for the sake of Europeans, we hope that is recognized as an issue quite quickly. We are fairly bullish on Japan because we think Japan has the advantage of being a single country, unlike Europe. It's facing many of the same challenges as Europe, but at least has the, the capacity to adapt through the currency. On emerging markets, we think there's a very mixed outlook. We are, by and large, very bullish on India, where besides the, uh, the very beneficial impacts of the change of government, we believe that India is about to get lucky and the oil prices are falling, and that's really going to give their, their economy quite a good tailwind. It will allow the central bank to cut interest rates over the course of uh, 2015, and that will mean you have a very vir virtuous cycle emerging. On China, we are a little bit more agnostic. We can see some pockets of interest there, but the adaptive process to switch the economy from investment to consumption is going to be a painful one. Mathematically, it's in our view not possible to achieve growth of much more than about 5% while that switch is taking place, and even that may be optimistic. And on Latin America and Africa, we are a little bit more pessimistic. Clearly, the commodity super cycle has run its course, and those economies are going to be quite exposed to that factor. And of course, there are also some quite worrying trends, particularly in Brazil, in terms of the political cycle. On the other hand, Mexico, we see as being a very interesting area to look at that we haven't yet invested in, because we do see the political cycle there running quite positively.